Hello, and welcome to the Multilingual World Podcast. If, like me, you're fascinated by language and languages, you've probably asked yourself questions like, how multilingual is the world? Where are the world estimated 7,000 languages spoken? And which countries have the lion's share? How is this wealth of linguistic diversity managed by individuals, groups, and governmental authorities through language policies and what are the consequences of such choices? Why do people stop speaking and transmitting their heritage languages and shift to dominant languages? What can we do to stop the 60 to 90% of the world's languages from disappearing? To explore these questions and many more, I will be interviewing influential academics and multilingual speakers living in Manchester to discuss aspects of multilingualism in different parts of the world, dispel the myths of inferior and primitive languages, and most importantly, we will discuss how language science contributes to improving access to better education and health, and how central it is to socioeconomic development and to fight social inequalities. I'm Dr. Serge Sanya. I'm a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Manchester, and I'm very excited to welcome you to the Multilingual World Podcast. Okay, so welcome back to another episode of the Multilingual World Podcast from the University of Manchester. Today, I'm uh, very happy to welcome our very own Professor Delia Bentley from our department, Linguistics, an English language at the University of Manchester. And uh, Delia is a professor of uh, Romance Linguistics, right? Am I right, Delia? Yes, yes, that's correct. And uh, your work in linguistics is includes specializations on uh, discourse and syntax interface, lexical semantics and syntax interface. But what you're interested in today is your expertise on the lesser known Romance languages and particularly Italian dialects. That's correct, yes. So before we start, Delia, I'd like to ask a question, a personal question. How did you get interested in linguistics? How did this, the interest in linguistics develop in you? Um, I, um, I grew up in a bilingual family. Um, we spoke, uh, Italian and another Romance language. Um, that means another language derived from Latin, a sister of Italian. Um, that was Sicilian. Sicilian. And yes, yes. And, um, so I was exposed to, um, linguistic diversity since birth, really, and I was always fascinated by um, by the ability that we have as humans of speaking different languages. So I was always determined to uh, learn at least a few more um, languages. Um, what I did not realize until much later, until I went to school, was that there was a very um, strict unspoken set of rules in my family about who was supposed to speak which language to whom and when um, but it wasn't spoken uh, but uh, <laughs> um, it was uh, followed <laughs> very um, precisely and that wasn't an unusual situation most families the families of my friends worked in the same way so that added to my interest in language and how linguistic diversity works. How did the rule work? What was it like? Um, the older generations uh, um, spoke Sicilian with each other and they spoke um, Italian to us and uh, um, we were mainly supposed to speak Italian to them. Um, so, in fact, I grew up as a native 
hearer of Sicilian, but not quite a native speaker of Sicilian. Um, I heard it from birth. I have native intuitions, but uh, there was always that, you know, awareness that for me, it wasn't a language that I should speak. I should know it, but not speak. But uh, the older generations uh, spoke it fluently, constantly, continuously um, in the family. So it's like an unspoken language policy within yes, the family. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, did you learn it later or did you learn to speak it later? Um, not fluently, not no. fluently. Um, but uh, it, it very much depends uh, on um, what you do as a profession. Uh, my sister is a school teacher, so she learned to speak it fluently because um, many of her pupils, uh, when they get to school, uh, they are more familiar with Sicilian than with Italian, and it helps her to connect with them. Mm. So, okay, so we are interested in, you know, the linguistic situation of Italy today, right? And uh, there's a, a book by Lepsky and Lepsky, which was published in 1977, and the second edition was published in 1988. <clears throat> and in the beginning of the book, they were saying something like, if you, you ask students from planet Mars to write a report, on the linguistic situation of Italy. What are they likely to come up with? What kind of picture, you know, um, might they, you know, uh, uh, portray or come up with for the, for the non, like, you know, for the non-Italians, let's say. How diverse, the question is, how diverse is Italy linguistically? It is extremely diverse. So students from Mars, students uh, who don't know about Italy, if they land in Italy, uh, they'll be amazed at the um, linguistic diversity that they are faced with. Um, there is a single official language of Italy and that is Italian, but um, then there are um, dozens of other languages that are spoken in different parts of Italy. Some of them are um, Romance languages, so Latin languages derived from Latin, so they stand in a similar relation to Italian as Spanish or French or Catalan do. Uh, others are uh, not Romance languages. There are also languages from other language families. Like? Um, most Italians are speakers of not one language, but at least two. Uh, although, of course, one of them may be more, they may be more fluent in one of them. So you're talking about languages, right? Different languages completely. And earlier you talked about uh, Sicilian as a sister yes. of uh, standard Italian, let's say, right? So what, what, can you describe a little bit what you mean by sister for the non-linguist, sister language, sister to Italian? Yes. If you speak Sicilian, for example, can you understand standard Italian? Oh, let me rephrase this. A speaker of Italian, standard Italian, you know, who has no exposure to Sicilian, would that speaker be able to understand Sicilian? Uh, to an extent, to an extent. Um, the mutual intelligibility between Italian and uh, these different Romance languages uh, varies a lot. It depends which language. Some of them are um, more distant uh, from Italian than others. Um, uh, so the relation between Italian and Sicilian, I would compare it uh, to the relation between Italian and Spanish. Um, you, 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 you can follow to an extent, and then at some point you will get lost. Um, uh, but um, 
uh, a speaker of one of the languages of the South, if they hear uh, someone speaking one of the languages of the North, they will get lost very soon. So the, 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 the mutual intelligibility, the, the possibility of understanding each other is much more limited. So you have like many languages. You talked about dozens of languages. Do you know roughly? I know it's hard to count languages, obviously. Linguists know that. But roughly, could you give a sense of how many for the non-linguists? Um, I can show you a map. Uh, it's very difficult to... Um, it's very difficult to come up with a figure. The problem is that um, <clears throat> there are groups of such languages which are very similar to each other and within these groups uh, there is mutual intelligibility so people do understand each other even though they come from different places um, but then again if uh, even though they understand each other there are also differences in the ways that these different people speak so you could give a figure uh, say of uh, um 10 Romance languages, but you could also say 50. So it's 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 very difficult. But I have a map. It, yeah, it, yeah, let's look at the map. Um, I could show just to give a sense of... Uh, um, oops, um, sorry. Uh, I'll uh, share again. Okay, yes. Can you, can you see the map? Yes, I can. There you go. These different colors uh, represent groups of Romance languages, so, so uh, subfamilies hmm, of Romance languages. Um, there is quite a large one here in the north called Gallo-Italian, and these are languages uh, spoken in Piedmont, Lombardy, uh, Emilia-Romagna, Liguria. Uh, I'm, these are names of regions, uh, political units within, uh, within Italy. Um, then a different group or a different language is uh, uh, the group spoken in uh, Veneto. And then here we have a Friulian. And here we have another one called Ladin. And uh, as you will have noted, I haven't mentioned these, the, the pink ones yet. I will come back to those. Um, then here we have another language or another group of languages called the Tuscan. And then we have the, the dialects of the center and or of the middle, as we call them in Italian. And then the dialects of the south and then the dialects of the extreme south, which includes Sicilian, which is the one that I was, I grew up with. And then we have the Sardinian group mm -hmm. and Sardinians are actually very, feel very, very strongly that within this brown area, there are at least um, three different languages. Okay. Even though we see one, only one uh, color. Oh, and then there's another group in the north. And, and these are all languages that are very um, uh, closely, very, very similar from the point of view of a linguist. They are very similar to Italian. OK, Italian is uh, the development of one of these languages, the development of the language spoken in Florence in this region. So it comes from one of these languages. Um, and in fact, I should say that uh, the indigenous language of this island, Corsica, which does not belong to Italy politically, of course, it belongs to France, but uh, the indigenous language spoken here, Corsican, is, uh, belongs to the same group as Tuscan, is very close yeah. to Italian, much closer to Italian than it is to French. Okay. Um, and, and so these are all very close to Italian, but then we have others, other languages that are spoken in Italy. Um, for instance, here in the Northwest, we have uh, Occitan and Franco-Provencal and French. Um, they are of course also Romance language. 
but also some non-Romance languages, languages that don't come from Latin. So this is a region that is a bilingual Italian-German, okay? Mm. They have the same status. And in the far Northeast, we have uh, uh, speakers of Slo Slovene, okay? Because of contact, of course, so with Slovenian. Mm. Um, here we have pockets of uh, uh, Greek speaking areas in the very south and the situation here has been like this for thousands of years uh, since the time of the, um, the when Greece also included the southern Italy and then we have large areas where Albanian uh, languages or dialects are spoken here in Sicily and here in the whole of southern Italy we have Serbo-Croat here from an immigration centuries ago. And so is Albanian from immigration too? Yes, yes, immigration. So, so in fact, we have two groups. Uh, we can we can distinguish uh, two um, two ways of immigration. An old one that started centuries ago, say in the fifteenth century, and this is why this is when all these um, set Albanian settlements. Um, started um, in Italy. Uh, but then in the last 30 years, we've also had many more Albanian peoples come to Italy. So the numbers of Albanian speakers in Italy has increased exponentially. Nowadays, we are in the maybe half a million speakers even, uh, but most of them are recent uh, um, speakers. Um, so they don't they weren't born in these uh, in these uh, in these villages here. Okay. Okay. And then I think I should mention, lest I forget, uh, in there is a town here in north northwestern Sardinia. It's called Alghero, and they speak a Catalan, um, a variety of Catalan. Catalan, of course, is another <coughs> Romance language. <coughs> Sorry, uh, the language of Catalonia in the eastern part of the, um, the Iberian Peninsula, to the east of the area where Castilian is spoken. And it's also spoken in the, the Balearic Islands, and it's spoken here in, uh, in, uh, in Sardinia. And all these languages, the majority of these languages, those that derive from Latin, they are there because they are developments of Latin. Italy was, of course, the center of the Roman Empire. The very center was Rome, here in the center of Italy. And, and when the Roman Empire ended, it was fragmented and different people continued to speak their Romance language in their own way. And so all these languages developed um, independently of each other. And many of them also had, um, they were also written. We have many of documents, many documents starting from the 10th century. But the, the fact is that even though some of them were prestigious for a while, then they lost that prestige. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's why for centuries now they've been called dialects, even though they are languages in their own right. Dialect in the context of Italy does not mean the same as in the UK or in the USA. A dialect is not a corruption of a language or a variety of Italian. A dialect is a separate Romance language, but it's called a dialect because it doesn't have any sociopolitical recognition or it doesn't, or, or hardly any. So it's a political definition of dialect, basically. That absolutely, is absolutely, yes. Okay. yes. So ha has there been attempts by linguists to actually use languages to, you know, reflect the reality on the ground, to reflect the term, lang to use the term language instead of dialect, to uh, attempt to, uh, you know, influence the, you know, the description of those languages? Um, in terms of the... The terminology used, the linguists have not been very forthcoming, I could say. Some have, but not many of them. So there are many, there, there are linguists, especially in the North, um, 
who are keen on calling these regional languages as opposed to dialects. So, so to be fair, I should note that. Mm -hmm. Other than that, many Italian linguists are happy with the term dialect, mm -hmm. but they have, they have petitioned for more recognition and um, they, they have tried to point out that this is uh, um, a tremendous resource that we have that we could use in various domains mm. and that um, has been neglected and almost ignored for, uh, for um, since the beginning, really. Yeah. Now, if we go back to our analogy, you know, uh, with mm -hmm. students from Mars. So if we go back to the map, if you show the map again. Yes. What, what is clear here is that, you know, we don't have a homogeneous, you know, linguistically homogeneous place as, Absolutely. you know, people might think, because most people would think that, well, if you go to Italy, all you need to know is Italian mm -hmm. and then you're sorted, right? Wherever you go, you can manage, right? But you've just shown that there are different languages and obviously there is standard Italian. So if we look at standard Italian for a second, how did standard Italian develop? You showed actually that it started in the, you know, in the Florence area. Yes. So how did it develop and how did it spread as a, um, let's say, a national language to the point of becoming the official language? Yes, this is a, this is a very good question. Um, let me just start by saying that I, I, I'm not um, I'm not sure that a standard Italian exists. Sometimes oh. linguists call it normative Italian um, to refer to the language that children are encouraged to use at school to, and that we learn to use in writing and that is used in. Uh, official contexts such as administration or in court. Um, but um, Italians do not grew up, uh, grow up as native speakers of standard Italian. Italians grow up as native speakers of uh, a regional variety of Italian, a, a variety of Italian that uh, lives in contact with the other Romance language or the other Romance languages of their region. And so is influenced by those languages. So just to give you an example, in Italian, there are seven vowel sounds, seven vowels, vowel sounds, but Italians from different parts of Italy um, may have fewer <laughs> vowels or more. And uh, even those who have uh, the same seven vowel sounds as uh, you know, you're supposed to have in Italian, they may use them differently in different contexts. And that's fine. That's absolutely um, fine. Italians live with this diversity. Even when we speak Italian, we speak it differently. We understand each other. It is absolutely fine. There is no, um, no stigma attached to this. Some features are stigmatized, but others aren't. A lot of them aren't. So there's no uh, people's general attitude towards regional variety is a positive one? Generally speaking, Yes. Then, of course, each some some varieties are more prestigious than others, and also some particular features of individual varieties are stigmatized. And then, going through education means to losing those features because you know that you don't want to be associated with that with that okay. stigma. But by and large, it, Italians grow up knowing that Italian is not spoken in the same way all over Italy, and that is accepted. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's already one step. That's one step. So to return to your question, so um, Italy has not been a nation for a long time. It has only been a nation since 1861. So that's 160 years ago. Um, 
And the, the interesting thing about the history of Italian is that Italian existed before Italy was a nation. Um, the, the, so you asked me, how, how was it that the dialect of Florence became um, the language of Italy? Um, around the 14th century, uh, literary figures and scholars and intellectuals in, uh, in, in this area, uh, mainly in Tuscany, the area of Florence, but uh, in, uh, in some parts of Italy, they, they began to ask the question, what language should be given prestige? They were aware that there was um, an incredible uh, number of languages uh, in such a small part of the world. Um, but there was movement, there was trade, and there was uh, there was quite a bit of mobility. So, and, and there was also a sense of, uh, you know, wanting to have uh, um, a culture that went beyond regional boundaries or beyond the boundaries of the political states and entities that were part of Italy at the time. So they began to ask that question. And um, by the 16th century, the language of Florence and more generally the language of Tuscany had emerged as the uh as, as as the best candidate for that role and that was mainly for two reasons so one was that uh, florence had produced the, the three most important literary figures of italy uh dante dante alighieri petrarch and boccaccio and and so there was um <coughs> a literary production in that language that was recognized as as very prestigious. And the other reason was that Florence was a very powerful city. Uh, it was a center of trade, a center of uh, a fi financially, it was a very, very rich place. And so this mixture of cultural and financial power um, determined the choice of uh, that particular uh, language as the language of Italy. And then in the 17th century, uh, a scientist, Galileo Galilei, chose Tuscan as the language of his writings. He, he insisted on writing in this new language, hmm? as opposed to Latin. Hmm? Mm. And so that also contributed to the prestige of of, of this language. And so when eventually Italy was formed, the, the kingdom of Italy was formed in 1861, <clears throat> there was a language that, um, in, that, that, that was available as the language of the newly formed nation. Although, um, interestingly enough, uh, hardly any of the people of this nation were familiar with it because there was a very, very high percentage of illiterate people, something like 78%. And, um, and, and, and illiteracy meant speaking the Romance language of your, your hometown. Yeah. Um, so Italian was a foreign language. The oh. language of their own, country was a foreign language to the Italians of that time. Mm -hmm. So a very small percentage of people could speak it, a small a smaller percentage could even write it. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes, yes. Okay. And that so, situation lasted for decades, for quite a long time. Okay, so uh, through the 19th century, let's say, uh, through the 19th century. So a pivotal moment was World War I. Okay. Because for the first time, people from different parts of Italy came together. They were fighting mm. together side by side in the trenches. And so they wanted to communicate with each other. Of course, of course, um, yeah. And they also wanted to write home. Um, okay. So which, 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 um, 
posed the question, you know, how do you write home if you cannot write? And in which language? If the language that is your 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 mother tongue has never been written or not for centuries. Mm? Yeah, yeah. So at that time, people started to, they really had um, an opportunity and uh, a reason to make an effort to begin to write yeah. uh, and speak Italian. And, uh, and so that, that was a very important moment. And then, of course, after World War the First, little by little, of course, the, the literacy levels uh, grew. Um, and then there was a very, um, a very, um, not, not, not a very nice um, circumstance. So during the, the period of fascism, of course, the fascist regime only encouraged the use of Italian. Oh, okay. they, they strongly, strongly discouraged the use of dialects because, of course, uh, having one language meant being one nation. And it was part of the, you know, the, the, the image that they wanted to give of this nation. And it, it happened in other countries in Europe, of course, all the... All the, um, the ideology, yes, the ideology yes. according to which uh, one language, one nation has to have one language only. Absolutely, yes. So monolingual, totally monolingual. Yeah, which and... isn't realistic because even with that, they still can <laughs> erase diversity. Absolutely, absolutely. There was, there continued to be, a, a, you know, a lot of diversity everywhere. Um, but, but people only learned they, when they went to school. They learned Italian. They learned it as a foreign language, but they had to learn to write and speak in Italian. So, the the rising of the levels of education, which in itself is a positive thing, of course, yeah. but it also meant. Uh, uh, increased bilingualism, but it also increased this uh, perception of the other languages as the poor cousins. You know, they were there, you know, as a as a reality, but not as a as something that people should be proud of yeah. or should capitalize on as another resource, as another ability. You know. Yeah. yeah. So using language, um, uh, the all these different languages as a tool that could help, you know, to develop education and uh, um, other areas. Yes, yeah. yes. So, in fact, if we mention education, it was not until 1975, more or less, when a group of linguists led by someone called, a very famous linguist called Tullio De Mauro, uh, they they formed a group that really took you know the issue of education on board, and they promoted this idea of uh, a democratic linguistic education. And the, the key insight there was that uh, um, the dia the what we call the dialects, the other Romance languages, uh, had to play a key role in education because children got to school, when children got to school, they were familiar with those dialects and those dialects were part of their identity. And you cannot, you cannot um, enable or encourage someone to reach their full potential unless you recognize who they are and their yeah. languages were part of their identity. So they had to be, used in the can in the classroom they had to be the, the the comparison of the different languages had to be used as a tool to become more proficient in all of those languages uh, and and there has been some progress in that in that respect i must say probably not as much as we would have liked to have seen but there has been some it's so in the introduction of these languages in uh, education in different parts of um uh, of Italy. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the introduction of the idea that rather than being ashamed, you should be proud and you and you should compare your own Romance language and your own variety of Italian with the variety that you're learning at school, because that gives you an opportunity to learn about different registers yeah. and different functions of different languages and that that's that's a tremendous 
um, resource resource that you have in the classroom. Yeah. So okay. So let's continue with education. But if yes. we go back to the map, yes, and I see different numbers. Yes. My first question here is: Are these numbers? A reflection of the number of languages spoken in the area or is it just an you know uh, are you just numbering the areas just for reference um they are reflections of different languages so if you if we start from here one yeah. is uh, the uh is associated with ligurian which is uh, one of these languages uh, spoken in this area, and two with the Piedmontese. So they are a reflection of different languages. That said, even within those areas, within those numbers, you could uh, draw even finer differences. Differences, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if we come back to education, the question is when you have so many, like, you know, languages, for example, in Sicily, how did they introduce those languages you know into the education system how did they use them to help as resources to help children let's say access you know education in their first language on their home languages so what what was introduced was a new approach an approach that did not punish children for speaking sicilian or their own you know, uh, family language in the classroom, but that actually encouraged the reflection on um, the linguistic diversity. Um, and so the differences and similarities between uh, the language spoken in the family and the language um, heard on TV or, you know, learned at school. So these languages were not introduced uh, as uh, languages that we learn at school. Mm? To the best of my knowledge, Sicilian is not taught at school anywhere. Okay. Um, but they were, what, what changed was the approach um, uh, from an attitude of, um, you know, encouraging shame uh, yeah. to encouraging uh, reflection and uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. So awareness and acceptance of... Uh, yes. So do you know if uh, teachers, for example, would accept a child giving an answer to a question asked in standard Italian on a different language? Do you have any knowledge of um, that? There is a there is a great deal of um, variation here in Sicily. In primary school, most teachers will have to accept it because a lot of kids um, at the very beginning they will be more proficient in Sicilian than they are in Italian. And it's not only that; it's not only a matter of uh, how competent the child is uh, in uh, language X or language Y, but it is also a matter of the, 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 the one language being more expressive and more um, uh, appropriate in some cases uh, than the other. So typically these other Romance languages, other than Italian, um, speakers turn to them when they want to express a feeling or when they want to make a joke or when they want to signal um, um, in-group um, membership. Uh, yes, um, cohesion. And so it is very important to, to accept that at some point uh, that is the... Uh, uh, the language to to use in that particular context, but but um, uh, as I said, uh, there is a great deal of variation um, in in Sardinia. This is Sardinia, this island. Um, there is also, in fact, in Sardinia, many people are actually proud of. Uh, their Romance language. And the Sardinia is one of the very few parts of Italy where speakers are keen on calling Sardinian or their own variety, they call it a language. 
okay? okay? And that's a sign of pride, okay? Which is great. And there are some schools where they even teach Sardinian. So it's even, you know, they've gone a step further. They even produce materials uh, in Sardinian and uh, so that the, the kids even have, you know, the books to, 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 to think about um, their language and Italian and compare them. Uh, but in other regions, it's not like this. So there are regions where, partly for independent reasons, reasons such as um, uh, urbanization and industrialization and uh, a great deal of mobility. And so people there coming from various different parts of Italy and of the world, in, in those places, uh, the, 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 the other romance language doesn't really enter the classroom. Uh, not because it's uh, it's banned, but but because it doesn't, because it's not used, um, not mm, or it is hardly used anymore. Even in the family, it's. Uh, oh right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, so could you characterize the situation in Italy in general as a diagnostic situation? Italy has a history of Daglossia. So in 1861, when, when the Kingdom of Italy was formed, uh, it, it was a situation of clear Daglossia. So Italian was the official language, um, but uh, in most situations in everyday life, uh, most of the vast majority of Italians uh, didn't use Italian. And so really, a real, uh, there was a really uh, clear cut um, demarcation between uh, the domains where Italian was used and the domains of the other languages. But little by little, that process of uh, um, increased mobility and increased access to Italian through education of people from various different regions uh, <laughs> determined uh, uh, a change. The boundaries between uh, the different languages became much more fluid. So nowadays, I wouldn't say that there is a situation of diglossia in Italy. A term that uh, some that Italian linguists use is dilalia, dilalia, they call it, dilalia, which means fluid diglossias. Yes, there are there are different languages and yes, there are contexts where it would be inappropriate to use language X and we have to use language Y, but there is a great deal of fluidity. So instead of having like a high variety that is used in uh, administration, government business, a clear separation with the lower ones that are used in you know, everyday life, you have a fluidity between well, what like Italian, what is called Italian, I suppose. Uh, um, and, you know, the other vari regional varieties, I suppose. You have a great deal of fluidity, but not in all contexts. So if, if you think about administration or if you think about court, um, yeah. then it's only Italian. In those contexts, uh, it so is... that is strictly Italian. What if you're in an area where... You know, in Sicily, for example, where I was going to say you have a speaker who's more comfortable speaking uh, Sicilian than um, uh, than standard Italian, if I can say standard Italian. <laughs> um, well, um, I suppose it boils down to how proficient that speaker is with the Italian. They will strive towards Italian. They will to Italian. use Italian. But yes. Would the court, for example, allow, you know, uh, someone to use Italian, another variety, another regional variety to, you know, uh, in court, if they're more comfortable with? Um, they would... They would allow it as a as a fact of life, as a, something that you can't avoid. But because nowadays most people have some competence in Italian, in they Italian. will they will use uh, their own variety of Italian. 
Yes. So, okay. So would that be the case also for administration? In, uh, administra in administration, would Italian be the main language? It is the main language. That is. Uh, I mean, the, the only. Uh, that, I was going to say the only, not main. Um, it is the only language in most parts of Italy, but there are regions in Italy um, which have a special permission, okay, mm -hmm. to use also another language as the language of administration. There are not many such regions. So, so uh, Sardinian. Sardinia is one such region. And then we have the officially bilingual region. So this one in pink in the north is officially bilingual uh, Italian and German. Yeah. And um, so they are both official languages. And then we have in Valle d'Aosta in the northwest, we have uh, um, Italian and French as both official languages. Here we have a language called Ladin, which have, has uh, some official recognition. So in these cases, uh, the other language can also be used, uh, or in fact is also used uh, for administrative purposes. And this is a uh, official recognition by the central government? This is, uh, a, it works on two levels. There is official recognition by the central government, which was obtained in 1999 with the passing of a law called um, Regulations on the Matter of uh, um, the Historical Linguistic Minorities of Italy. Um, and that law was came after the signing of the um, European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages, mm -hmm. which for Italy happened in 1992, although it wasn't, it was hardly ratified, but then they, they passed this law, um, which protected the, some of the languages and gave that official status to some of the languages. But there is also official recognition at regional level. So there, there is also provision from the regional governments um, to, um, uh, to, to ratify the use of those languages for administrative purposes. And uh, how about the media? Are these languages also, when they're, if they are recognized officially at the by the central government or the you know um regional level are those languages used in the media do they have let's say radio shows uh, uh, some of them do um not not many but uh, the languages here of the north east for instance not only german but also ladin and friulian yes they are used to some extent but they they do have their their presence in the uh, in the media and also french of course in uh, in in the northwest how about education if we come back to education when they when a language has an official recognition like german and uh, French. Is it used in bilingual education? Uh, it, it is, yes, it is. Uh, and again, the situation it differs. Uh, each case is different from the others, uh, partly because this depends on, uh, on regional legislation, not only on national legislation, um, but, uh, but the language is also used in education, yes. And, uh, or it is taught at school, like with Ladin. With Ladin, there are there is provision so that children will learn it at school if they don't speak it already. Okay, but so this is a law, the 1999 law. I think yes. It was the 15th of December or something like that from uh, uh, the sources I've looked at. Does this law only protect these, let's say there are minority languages in Italy, but these are also languages that are majority languages somewhere else, right? At least for some of them. Uh, yes, so this is, the law is about uh, the protection of these languages in Italy. So how how is this law protecting the Italian, you know, uh, 
languages, let's say those that are called Italian dialects, how does this protection reflected on the Italian, you know, uh, I'll call them languages. Yes, yes, absolutely. And you should. Um, <clears throat> um, this is a very good question. And this is a question, this is the question which linguists asked after this law was passed. In a sense, they, they turned to the government and said, why did you not speak to us? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, because no one speaks to linguists when it comes to language matters it seems uh, yes yes that was the feeling uh, because really it is great that uh, those few languages obtained um, official recognition but the choice of these languages was um it was not based on very, very good, very sound uh, principles, because um, this law doesn't protect other languages, which are just as important um, as part of our culture, our heritage, our identity. And even though uh, speakers in different regions may have different uh, feelings. Uh, some speakers are not all that bothered, but still, um, these languages are part of our culture. So uh, there should be some provision to, um, to, to enhance awareness, if nothing else, um, to um, discourage uh, shaming um mm. and 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 that that didn't happen with this law okay okay so more work to do yes <laughs> um the other thing i was going to ask is uh you know so you have the traditional minorities let's say you know or the languages that have been there let's say for centuries either through migration or because they were well, they've always been there and they spread from Latin, you know, sister languages of, let's say, uh, uh, standard Italian. Um, if you, again, standard Italian, you know. So, or, or normative so, Italian. Or, yeah, yes. normative or Italian. common Italian with, with also. Italiano normativo. With my... Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, I should say, sorry for interrupting you, but uh, yes, apart from Italiano normativo, there is also let's say a common italian or pan a pan italian variety as we call it so which is uh, what is it it or is the... basically the way that uh, educated people speak to each other all over italy so they will keep their sound system and they will keep their um items of vocabulary which are um come from their particular region but they also by and large share um uh, the the bulk of the language, uh, so um, it 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 isn't uh, normative because it allows for different uh, uh, vowel repertoires. It allows for a lexical variation, but at the same time, it is shared all over Italy. Okay, and uh, yeah. So what I was going to ask in you know in relation to that was the popular Italian, right, which is like at another level, I would maybe. How is the situation now with youth languages? And that's one, the first part of my question. So I'm talking about the diversity now, the variation within, you know, uh, Italy at different levels of society. At the same time, I'm, I'm just going to link it to a question, another question about, you know, another type of diversity the multilingualism from migration. So there are other migrations, there are another wave of migration. Maybe I shouldn't link these questions, but you can you know, talk about one and then move to the other. Yes, yes. Um, so um, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, yes, we can, we can, linguists like to distinguish 
different varieties of Italian. So there is Italiano normativo, normative Italian, which is uh, the one, how it is supposed to be, and the Italian that uh, um, is used in official documents and so on and so on. Um, and then there is uh, um, Italiano comune, which as I said, is the way that people communicate or educated people communicate with each other all over Italy, which allows for some degree of regional variation, but not a great deal. Um, and then there is this notion of popular Italian, which uh, originated at the time of the First World War, which I mentioned earlier, because that, that first variety of Italian that people who were native speakers of different languages shared you know, in the trenches, um, mm. that, that was called the popular Italian. It was heavily influenced by the other Romance languages or dialects. But little by little, that has transformed into a sort of um, a, a pan-Italian variety, a variety that is shared by all, but uh, is um, not very prestigious. And it has... Uh, features that are, um, in a sense, they are associated with low levels of education. Okay, so it is, uh, it is Italian linguists call it a, a sociolinguistic variety because it correlates uh, with uh, sort of not particularly high levels of education. And uh, so that, that they call, it, it's like common Italian, but uh, it has, you know, the connotation of being used in informal registers and not being particularly educated. Um, and then, of course, there are uh, there is there is the language of young people, the jargon of young people, and then there are jargons of particular professions. So then we have we have various varieties of Italian. And sometimes linguists, uh, starting from a linguist called Gaetano Berruto, they describe them as um, concentric circles, circles that are one inside the other. Yeah. Um, the outer circle is uh, the, the, the pan-Italian variety, which the, the, the variety of Italian that is uh, spoken everywhere which also has uh, some features from different regions. And then there is uh, the circle of uh, popular Italian, which is much more influenced by uh, regional provenance and uh, level of education, other social factors. And then inside we have these other uh, uh, dimensions of variation, such as uh, the language of young people, the language of uh, different professions. Uh, and then, of course, in the center, we also have the difference between the different media, written, spoken, uh, and so on. And where does uh, Normativo uh, stand in, all, in that circle? It, it's, uh, in a sense, it's not there. Oh, it's not there. It is, it is a bit of an abstraction. It is outside. Um, it is, I, it is, okay. yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like saying Italian does not exist. <laughs> Italian so is... Standard Italian does not exist. What we have is, uh, in our circle, are these different varieties of uh, that are actually spoken, that are used on every day, right? Standard Italian is an abstraction. It's an uh, abstraction. That, okay. Yes, uh, it, it probably doesn't exist uh, as a um, as a native language. So no one really speak it as a uh, native language. Or maybe very few people speak it as a very uh, native. Or a few people uh, speak it because of their profession, because of their role, and because they're highly educated and so on. But it, it is an abstraction. Or an aspiration in some cases, but um, yeah. Yeah. So before we finish, so how what is the future of uh, you know the Italian languages or Italian dialects as they're called? Yes, what I, do I think. Do. What do you think? Oh, actually, I forgot. I didn't answer your second question second about question, the other yes, languages. Yes. So let me mention this because it's very very important in the linguistic uh, um, situation of Italy nowadays. 
um, since the late 80s, so the 90s, uh, there have been uh, um, tremendous uh, demographic changes uh, in Italy with the Italian population um, or the population of the, uh, the children of the people who already living uh, lived there becoming smaller because the birth rate in Italy is very, very low. Um, but at the same time, we've had um, uh, people coming from different countries. Um, and so nowadays uh, we have languages uh, from other countries, uh, um, many other countries that are spoken, but they are spoken by many people in Italy nowadays. So um, the, the most... In the, those that are spoken by the biggest uh, groups of people are um, Romanian, Albanian, um, Chinese, um, then some languages uh, both from uh, Northern Africa and from Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Tagalog from the Philippines. So we have all these different languages. In some cases, uh, we have, so remember how I said that we have some Albanian communities here yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the south of Italy, but now in the north, we have quite large uh, co Albanian communities of which have joined Italy recently. So the linguistic repertoire of uh, Italians and of Italy has become even more rich and complex. And, um, Clearly for these people who come to Italy and settle in Italy, for them, uh, their, their highest aspiration is to learn Italian and become Italian and, uh, and not to be different from other people. But at the same time, they have their own um, language, which is part of their culture and which they speak with each other. Now, <clears throat> again, linguists have been speaking to the government or tried to, um, and, and saying, you know, again, this is a tremendous resource that we have because um, we have all these young people, young minds, uh, which are uh, bilingual and they become more and more mon uh, multilingual. And we should encourage reflection on linguistic diversity because they will become more proficient in Italian and, and more proficient in the other languages. And there is a hope that this new multilingualism can actually also have a positive effect for the historical Romance languages of Italy for two reasons. One is that uh, ling metalinguistic reflection in the classroom, of course, uh, is not limited uh, to a particular language. Uh, so once you start to discuss the difference between Italian and Tagalog, you may as well also discuss uh, the difference between <coughs> uh, Italian and Venetian and Tagalog and so on. And two, because um, many of these people, as they settle in Italy, they acquire Italian and uh, the Romance language of that particular area. I see this in my hometown in Palermo in Sicily, where um, many people who are, who are either first generation or second generation from uh, a variety of different countries, uh, um, they they speak fluent Sicilian, and mm -hmm. and that's wonderful because they can, uh, while bringing their language, they can also um, increase the chances of survival of uh, the autochthonous languages. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, wow, it's fascinating how multilingual Italy is. If you started from the beginning thinking that. You know, if you go to Italy, the only language you need is Italian. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> by now, by now, you know, actually, there are much more autochthonous languages of Italy, and there are more languages that, you know, came in through, you know, migration in different parts of, you know, areas uh, or periods of history. 
Yes, I mean, you will get by if you if you know Italian, you can get by anywhere, but uh, there will be time when you will ask yourself what happened here. I thought I knew Italian and... <laughs> but there will be know. like, you know, your awareness of the diversity of uh, yes. linguistic diversity of Italy will grow as you spend time there. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so what do you think the future of uh, Italian uh, languages is? Like, you know, the minority languages recognized or unrecognized, especially those that are not recognized, actually. I'm more interested on, you know, in those that are not recognized officially. Um, it's hard to tell. Um, I think they will continue to be there for a long time, um, but uh, different ones to different extents. Of course, the, uh, <clears throat> the big urban areas in the north, Milan, uh, those areas are tough environments for um, the autochthonous, so sort of the Milanese language and so on. Why? But they will, they will continue to be there for for a long time. I think. I think what we should. The question to be asked is: What can we do to make sure that um, we? We make the most of these languages that we um, um, just like we encourage people to think positively about their cultural heritage and about their history and about their artistic heritage, which is so rich in Italy. What can we do in, to encourage people to recognize that that's part of their cultural heritage and that's uh, an educational resource that's a way to be yourself and to connect with other people. There is a lot of work to be done, but I think, um, and, and, and these languages are receding. Intergenerational transmission is not great, but there are also positive signs. So I'd like to finish on a positive note. There are, as I said, you know, these new communities that we have in Italy, they don't come with that prejudice that Italians have, you know, that Italian is the language and the other Romance language is just a fact of life. They don't come with that prejudice. And that's great because they increase linguistic diversity. So, um, I, th I think with with some effort, uh, which Italian linguists uh, really put in, you know, um, there is a lot that can be done to continue to to have them those languages there in one way or another, in one form of another or another, and uh, to make sure that they are still part of our life and of our um, of our culture, of our identity. Thank you very much, Delia, for this fascinating conversation. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I learned a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully um, our audience have also learned a lot. And uh, you, on that note, thank you very much again. And uh, I see you next time for another episode of uh, Multilingual World Podcast. With pleasure. Goodbye. Before we go, remember that there is no education without language. There is no socioeconomic development without language. There is no meaningful political stability without good language management. Remember also that children and adults can function perfectly with multiple languages. So be a proud multilingual. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on our social media platforms, and See you very soon for another episode on the Multilingual World Podcast.